Kamurçu hoş geldiniz. Her hafta olduğu gibi Parev diyerek başlayalım programımıza. Bu hafta stüdyoda bir konuğumuz var. Kendisiyle birçok şeyi konuşabileceğimiz bir konuğumuz. Yıllardır Türkiye'ye gelip gidiyor. Bu sırada biz de onu yakalamaya çalışıyoruz. Belki siz de bazı konferanslarına, konuşmalarına denk gelmişsinizdir. Ronald Süni, Ronald Grigor Süni stüdyomuzda. Hoş geldin diyeceğiz kendisiyle. Bugünkü konuşmamız İngilizce olacak. Bu yüzden siz de sesleriyle takip edebileceksiniz. Biz daha çok İngilizce anlaşacağız aramızda. Ama kendisinin Ermencesi ve Türkçesi de gayet iyi kendi orta dese de. <gülüyor> biraz, biraz konuşuyorum, Türkçe konuşuyorum ama... <gülüyor> <gülüyor> Hepsini bir arada görmüş olduk. Evet. İngilizce başlayıp Türkçe ve İngilizce. İngilizce daha iyi mi? Evet. Welcome. Uh, first, thank you for uh, joining us for the, uh, for the program because I had so many questions and I wanted to uh, have this interview with you for a long time. Actually, I was I wondered uh, I, I I wanted to talk more about diaspora. Uh, we're from US, about, uh, but uh, the thing is I. I think, I, I know that, I learned that you are going to have a book, upcoming book, uh, so uh, what is it about first, let's uh, start with that and just a little bit introducing you to our guests, <laughs> our thank viewers. You, thank you, Aris. It's a pleasure to be here, of course. Basically, I'm a historian. I was born in the United States. My parents are both Armenian. My grandparents on my mother's side came from Diyarbakir mm -hmm. after the 1894-96 Hamidian massacres. My mother's mother's family fled to the United States. My grandfather, my mother's father, was born in Yozgat, trained in Yozgat, became a tailor. And after the 1909 Adana massacres of Armenians, he left and went to the United States. Those of their families that remained in Turkey, almost all of them were killed. Uh, in 1915 during the genocide. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in the United States, born there, grew up. English was my first language. I had to learn Armenian as a foreign language at, in graduate school mm -hmm. and later studied Russian and became basically a historian of the Soviet Union. I mm -hmm. was interested in the history of the Caucasus of Azerbaijan. My first book was on Azerbaijan called The Baku Commune. Baku And that book is in Turkish, by the way, in yeah. a pirated edition. I'm very happy. Anyone who wants to pirate any of my books is free to do it. And Why pirate it? Tra translate them into <laughs> Turkish. I like that. <laughs> so that book was my first book. Then I wrote a book on the making of the Georgian nation. So I learned Georgian. And finally, I wrote a book on Armenia, Armenia in the 20th century, and a, another book called Looking Toward Ararat, mm -hmm. Armenian in Modern History. Mm -hmm. So I've been involved in that. And then around the year 2000, a Turkish friend of mine, Mugay Gürçek, who also taught at the University of Michigan, and I began a project called WATS, the Workshop yeah. in Armenian Turkish Scholarship. That's uh, also an interesting point that mm -hmm. I wanted to discuss, I wanted to uh, make it more visible maybe, because it's it was in 2000. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, Actually, maybe our viewers will not know because our program started in 2011 uh, and it's before our channel founded, but uh, what started the process? Uh, what were we talking before the program also is important that first Hranting, when he had his passport, because he wasn't able to mm -hmm. get his passport back from the states, uh, state, uh, Turkish state, uh, when he got his passport, he came to U.S. first That's and right. you, your organization, what was That's the, right. uh, yeah. was Uh, inviting uh, mm -hmm. him. So how that process was uh, in uh, US and how you, because we and Turkish people, Turkish public, uh, for Turkish public, it's a, it's a devil in diaspora, uh, mm -hmm. the Armenian diaspora. So how was the first, uh, this touch, uh, even if it was over around and there were so ma many other people in yes. that what's organization. Can you tell about this, that experience? Let me tell you the story of how it actually happened. So in 1998, a student of mine was teaching here in Turkey at Koç University. Mm -hmm. And he invited me to come to give a lecture. And I agreed to come, but I said, if I come, I want to speak about the Armenian genocide, mm -hmm. which was a dangerous thing to talk about in those days, 1998. And he said, okay, you can come and talk about what you want. I'm leaving Turkey anyway soon, so it doesn't matter. Then I went to Mugay, my friend Mugay, and I said, Mugay, John, 
What if I go to Turkey and talk about the genocide? Well, is it dangerous? She said, oh, don't worry, Ron. If anything happens to you, we can get you out. <laughs> so I thought, oh, well, this is not so good. But I went, I spoke at Coach University, and it was amazing how well I was received, particularly by students mm -hmm. who were interested in the question, what happened in 1915? Why did it happen, etc." So when I returned to the United States with Muguet, with my friend Kevork Bardakshan, with others, uh, Girard Lebaridian and others, we organized this group called Watts, and we invited Turkish and Armenian scholars to come together. Mm -hmm. People like Halil Berktay, Engin Akarla, uh, Armenian scholars uh, like Aram Arkun and Kevork and so forth, and they came together, uh, and we began to discuss what happened in 1915 on a scholarly basis, leaving mm -hmm. politics aside, what happened? And it was extraordinarily successful. So we began to have more workshops at Michigan, here and there. And when we had the workshop in Strasbourg in Aust Austria, um, we also brought journalists as well. Mm -hmm. And one of the people who came early in the process was Hrant Dink. And we managed to get the passport and the visa for him to come to the States, which was, I think, the first time that he came to the United States. And mm -hmm. so he was working in our process. Out of this Watts meetings, Turkish scholars and Kurdish scholars here in Turkey decided to have their own conference in 2005. Mm -hmm. And it was supposed to be at Boazici. The government was opposed. So eventually it was held at Bilgi. Mm -hmm. And it was an amazingly successful. And Hrant was at the center of that effort as well. And then sadly in 2007, in January, he was murdered here in Istanbul. Uh, and that event, terrible as it was, was a kind of earthquake in Turkey. Mm -hmm. Suddenly from all over, people came and they realized there are other people who think like them and mm -hmm. they began to march, Hepimiz, Ermeniz, Hepimiz, Herantemiz, and so forth. They began to, to, to uh, find other voices like themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, all of these events, our little project, and the movement of what I call the progressive Turkish intellectuals, were coming together at the same time as the AKP party was coming to power in 2002. And though we were not working with them or considering any of this, it was an accident, a kind of historical conjuncture, the two things moved together mm -hmm. because we were questioning the deeply ingrained Kemalist narrative about the history of the end of the Ottoman Empire and the founding of the Republic. And Akipe was also interested in finding new ways of understanding the past of, of, of the Turkish Republic. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is so interesting. I wanted to yeah. have a parenthesis in it because you said that this process started in 1998 that you came here? 1999. Yeah, yeah. Or, 98. So, uh, it was before uh, AKP government, because before right. 2001. Yes. Because so many people in Turkey <laughs> now, they think that, okay, this whole process with Armenians, diaspora, Armenia, with Armenians in here, minorities, that all started with uh, AKP, the government uh, AKP. But actually, it started before. Uh, a bit before, right. and AKP joined maybe uh, for this uh, process. So it's uh, a bit interesting that how it started. You called that it's a suc successful meeting, uh, first Watts meeting. What was uh, the, what was the successful uh, for that? Okay, I want to I want to emphasize that that when we started our process we did not yet have connections with Turkish intellectuals. Mm -hmm. Indeed, Armenians in the diaspora didn't want to have any connection mm -hmm. with those intellectuals. Mm -hmm. And also, in the 1990s, even people like Hrant Dink were suspect mm -hmm. in the West because they were living in Turkey. They seemed to be collaborators. How can you live <clears throat> in Turkey, a state that destroyed the Armenian community, etc.? cetera? So to even to come here and to talk was considered a little bit strange, right? Mm -hmm. But when we came and we found out that there was here a lively civil society, there was what I've called the progressive Turkish intelligentsia already trying. People like Halil Berktay and Engin Nakarla and Fikret Adanir and I could go on. And, and mm -hmm. of course, Taner Akjam, who was outside the country uh, and many others. Then we realized, wait a minute, there's a dialogue possible we should start. <clears throat> so really our movement was already part of this current, but it had been started already 
within Turkey. That's important to know. Mm -hmm. And then when we got together, the Turkish mm -hmm. scholars said, don't think of us as Turkish scholars. Think of us as historians. I remember Halil saying that exact thing. Think about, we're interested in finding out ourselves what happened and why. And so we began to create a historical record of those events, right? Mm -hmm. Now I must say, in the Armenian diaspora, there was, in America particularly, there was resistance to this. There was, they were suspicious of why we were doing this. Why are we working with the Turks, these people who are supposed to be denying? Mm -hmm. The people we were working with were not denying. They were saying, we want to find out. We may not use the word genocide. That's a difficult problem. But we still are going to talk about what happened and why. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was very important. So uh, do, you, do you think that latest statement of uh, the President Erdogan, uh, Prime Minister Erdogan, was uh, saying uh, that, okay, uh, the historical commission, he was mentioning about this, and also Turkish uh, state organizations are always mentioning about uh, establishing a uh, historical uh, commission to observe, to see what happened, to find out what, what happened. Do you think that this uh, has also a common uh, mentality, what you and what's, uh, what have the, com uh, com the mentality? Because I think uh, let's find out what's happening when you are saying it. I think it's a bit different than what Turkish state means now. Uh, out absolutely, because, yeah. Uh, what, what is the difference and what was it for you? Well, first of all, it, uh, I think it's extraordinarily important that these issues be discussed. And mm -hmm. they're already being discussed mm -hmm. in the West, in Turkey, and in Armenia as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So new and younger scholars are coming up, finding out new things. Here in Turkey, you have a lot of younger scholars who are studying Armenian mm -hmm. and Greek. So they can actually do the whole history of the Ottoman Empire. The, they know Osmanlıca too. They know yeah. Ottoman Turkish as well as modern Turkish. So this is a whole kind of new development. Mm -hmm. And now you could have uh, a commission or uh, a conferences in which people could come together and talk about the real issues without necessarily uh, fighting with each other about facts and so mm -hmm. forth. Because we have much more of a historical record mm -hmm. than we had in the past. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is still a difficult problem. All I do is I urge people to look at the documents. You can read, it's now available in German and in English, mm -hmm. all of the documents of the German foreign ministry. Mm -hmm. The uh, Germans in 1915 were allies of the Turks. Mm -hmm. So they had their consuls out in Aleppo and Erzurum. And they were reporting on what was happening. And they could see that the state, the young Turk state, was trying to deport and massacre the Armenians. And they resisted. They wrote about this. The German government, however, said, no, they're our allies. We mustn't make waves, make it difficult for them. They look the other way. Mm -hmm. But we have these documents. It's not a problem anymore. When we're talking about the document, documents, that there are so many documents uh, and reports from uh, Ottoman Empire that right, time, 1915, right. uh, in uh, European countries. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes I think when, when they took uh, some quotations when Turkish historians, what, what I'm uh, reading in here about the books, of course, yeah. uh, I have to mention that the books about Turkish side in Turkey uh, the, uh, is more, much more than what's written about Armenians in Turkish. It's, uh, the, the, um, it's a, not balanced. But the thing is, is it uh, right to f uh, look f just for these documents, to these documents from German uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or uh, it's more important to be able to compare and read everything, like you said, Absolutely in Ottoman, right. to be understand. Because in one part, for example, lately, what I read in uh, Turkish with a, a book published in 1980, mm -hmm. uh, just to make the noise uh, against diasporian uh, protests in 24 mm -hmm. April. And it was writing, okay, even the Russians. Uh, says that, okay, we need an Armenia. In, this is a, they took a quotation from 1950 from a, a Russian general. Mm. And uh, he's saying, okay, we need an Armenia. We need an Armenia without, an Arme without Armenians. Right, there is such a point. So yeah. when you just took this quotation from it, it means something else. But yeah. we have to look for the whole report to be Absolutely able to right. understand. So how this has to be. You know, I will say this, Aris. It is very easy to write bad history. All you have to do is carefully select what you want to prove a certain thesis. That's 
easy. And there are many people who do it. And unfortunately, the Turkish state and its official historians for a long time did the same thing, mm -hmm. right? And on the other side, Armenians also, though they're defending the victims of this terrible event, the genocide, also did not look at the entire picture. Mm -hmm. But much of that has changed now mm -hmm. because you have better work, more serious research, looking at all the documents. You now have Armenians who know Turkish yeah. and Ottoman. You have Turks who are learning Armenian and Greek, as I said, and they can look at the whole complexity uh, mm -hmm. of the events. Let me just say a few things about these events. First of all, we now know that the young Turk government, that is Talat Pasha most particularly, Enver and Jemal to a lesser extent, decided in March of 1915 that they would deport Armenians because mm -hmm. they believed Armenians were allied to the Russians, mm -hmm. were aiding the Russians, and that the state was in danger. Mm -hmm. So they made an argument from national security to deport the Armenians mm -hmm. right, from the frontier. Now, what they, first of all they did was exaggerate the threat of the Armenians. Mm -hmm. Some Armenians were fighting on the Russian side. Mm -hmm. The great majority of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, including all the political parties and the church, all the leadership, was for fighting for the Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. And indeed, tens of thousands of Armenian young men were mobilized by the Armenian political parties and the church into the Ottoman army to fight against the Russians. So you had maybe 2,000 volunteers, Armenian volunteers on the Russian side. Most of them, except the commanders, were Russian Armenians fighting for the Russians. Mm -hmm. And tens of thousands of Armenian young men in the Ottoman Empire's army, including people who died at Sarikamish, the great battle of December 1914, January 1915, where Enver lost mm -hmm. 40,000 men. But after losing that battle, the young Turks decided it wasn't us who lost the battle. It wasn't us who sent these young Turks and Armenians hundreds of miles on foot into the mountains of Sarikamish, but it was those Armenian volunteers on the other side who caused us to lose this, this battle. And therefore, they began to take the Armenian soldiers out of their army, take their uniforms away, take their guns away, and form them into amile tabulare, mm -hmm. work battalions, labor battalions, and eventually to kill them, right? So by doing that, they have disarmed the Armenians. Yeah. And now they have women and children and old people that they can deport. So the deportations were not simply strategic. They came out of a very paranoid mental set, mm -hmm. what I call an affective disposition, Mm -hmm. That is an emotional universe in which the young Turks have now constructed the Armenians, imagine the Armenians as a, as a threat to their state who have to be eliminated. Mm -hmm. And that's the beginning of the genocide. What, uh, what you're telling about this history, that uh, that's also the selective, maybe the memory, because all the time in the educational system in Turkey, we are just learning that uh, how many people were fighting, how many Armenians were fighting, against the Ottoman Empire with the uh, Russian army. And what you're telling that also a comparison that, okay, the, like if uh, you're in states now, you're, you're going to fight for state's army right. you're, yeah. and uh, how Armenians are making their military service in Turkey and yeah. <clears throat> going other uh, places for their service. And uh, this is a selective memory which gives us all the time about Sarı Kamush and uh, history. But how and you talked about the writing the bad history is so easy yes <laughs> so how are we going to uh, not we i'm not going to be able to write it about it but how uh, this is going to be shaped uh, with uh, within to a uh, good history it's already happening it's already happening it's happening here in turkey it's happening in the west i hope it's going to happen more in armenia as well it's already young armenians are starting to look at this complexity. Mm -hmm. Historical events are not easy. They're mm -hmm. very complex. And you have to be careful how you use the documents. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that there are wonderful historians now, young, younger people, some older like myself, who are looking at the whole picture and beginning to see these complexities that I'm telling you about. For instance, Armenians have often looked at Armenians simply as victims, just mm -hmm. victims. 
not as actors, not as agents who are determining their own destiny, but simply victims who are destroyed by the Turks. Mm -hmm. The Turks look at themselves, imagine this, they are the ones who run the empire, they look at themselves as victims too. We're victims of these exploiting Armenians, these treacherous Armenians, and of the Western powers and Russia who are trying to destroy ourselves. So you have two nations which see themselves as victims, but each of them is actually acting and try. And the, the most interesting thing for me is that the Ottoman Empire was a cosmopolitan empire mm -hmm. in which non-Muslims, like Muslims, mm -hmm. wanted to live together. So Greeks, Armenians, Jews, Kurds, Turks, Laz, Arabs were all going to live in this empire together, mm -hmm. and, be, and they were Ottomans, they were Osmanli, mm -hmm. right? And most Armenians wanted that solution, mm -hmm. but they were being hurt by the, the lawlessness in Eastern Anatolia, particularly mm -hmm. at the hands of tribesmen, many Kurds, uh, some of the, the, the um, uh, nomads, etc. And they wanted two things. Armenians wanted two things. We want to stay in the Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm. but we want reforms. We want some protection in Eastern Anatolia. Mm -hmm. And in 1914, they got it. There was an agreement between mm -hmm. Russia, Germany, France, and England, and the Sultan's government for these reforms. But then, unfortunately, the war broke out, and the, the young Turks decided, we'll get rid of these reforms, we mm -hmm. won't have them, and indeed, we'll instead try a more radical policy to deal with the Armenian question. We will get rid of the Armenians themselves. Mm -hmm. And if we get rid of the Armenians, then there's no Armenian question. Mm -hmm. We don't have to worry about separation anymore. Do you think that they succeeded in their policy in this? Do you, getting rid of Armenians uh, is, is get, was getting rid of Armenians gives a, a stable nation uh, or stable uh, nation state uh, for Turkey? Or I will come to this point for another thing because mm -hmm. is it uh, Turkish Republic? Because uh, when we are talking about diaspora, Turkish uh, government is always and Turkey, uh, Turkish historians are always uh, thinking that, okay, the res uh, Turkish Republic, Tur uh, Turkey Republic is going to be responsible for all these happenings. And because of that, recognition and reconciliation processes is going to, uh, in the future, is going to cause uh, to give the lands or to lose the Republic. Uh, so this is a frightening process for the government when they look from this side, <laughs> because they think that Turkish Republic, Turkey Republic is going to be uh, responsible for all these happenings. So because of that, I'm uh, thinking that, okay, is maybe nine, after what happened in 1915, uh, it caused an unhealthy uh, Republican process for it. That's, a, that's an interesting way to put it. I would say, let's think of what the consequence of this event were. So if you are a Turkish nationalist, and you believe Turkey should only be for Turks, whoever yeah. they are, however we define Turks. And remember, Turks, Turk in, in 1900 meant a low class country person. Yeah. So the 20th century was a period in which the state, the Kemal state, made Turks. They created out of many people, Turks, right? Mm -hmm. And they even said Kurds were kinds of Turks, right? They were mountain Turks or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the first consequence of the genocide was that you eliminated the most cosmopolitan, multicultural society that existed in Anatolia. Mm -hmm. You actually, at the same time, eliminated civil society, much of the bourgeoisie, mm -hmm. much of the complex people, peoples who made industry and commerce. Mm -hmm. If you get rid of that, mm -hmm. Then you get, what, what power is left to make the new republic? Only the state. And so you have in Turkish history after the genocide, after the removal of the Greeks in 1922-23, you have then only the state to make the new republic. And you're still dealing with that problem. Yeah. You have a relatively growing civil society, but it took 100 years, and you still have a very powerful state and dealing with with Devlet and also Derin Devlet. Mm -hmm. You have these kinds of problems as well. So yes, you made a kind of Turkish national state, in a way, artificially. But at the moment, you have other problems. 
because you have Kurds. You have huge number, millions of Kurds in Eastern Anatolia. Mm -hmm. What used to be Armenia mm -hmm. is now Kurdistan. Yeah. Van was an Armenian city. Diyarbakir is where my grandmother came from. Now it's Kurdistan. And how are you going to deal with that? Are you going to impose a kind of Turkish ethnic nationalism on them? Or are you going to recognize that this is still a country with many different peoples? What I find most exciting in Turkey today, and maybe this program is a good example of it, is the way in which people are discovering that they have many different ancestors. Every time I go in the cab with a Kurdish taxi driver, he says, Ananem Ermeni. You know, yeah. they, everybody seems to have an Armenian grandmother nowadays, right? And this new discovery of the grandmothers, of the fact that hundreds of thousands of Armenian women and children mm -hmm. were converted into mm -hmm. Islam and grew up in Arab, Kurdish, and Turkish families mm -hmm. are now discovering their past. This kind of new Ottomanism, neo-Ottomanism, it seems to me is a very healthy mm -hmm. and progressive process in the, in the new Turkey. Mm. That's interesting. I wanted to talk about uh, your upcoming book. Uh, okay. I wanted to pass uh, to there, but also before that I want to have some opinions about being diaspora, born mm -hmm. in there, uh, coming to Turkey, visiting here, and it's so important for us, your opinions about what, what you see now in Turkey, but also being diaspora is also, uh, the Armenian diaspora is something uh, for Turkey that they're discovering now. For example, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs started to use the words for the last five years that, okay, this is our diaspora also. <laughs> but they're just covering some parts of diaspora or not. In Europe, it's different. Uh, in US, they're different. Mm. And we all, we also, uh, with the interview that we made with uh, Tanner Akcham in, during mm. this program a couple of months before, mm -hmm. he told us that uh, we uh, have the information that Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, some of the politica, uh, politics, some of bureaucrats, were talking with Armenian diaspora in the US, but, but saying that, okay, uh, we accept that this is a human uh, crime, about, uh, what happened in 1915, but we are not going to be able to use genocide, G word, genocide word, uh, for what's happening because the public is not ready yet. Turkish pub Turkey public mm -hmm. population is not ready yet. Uh, how diaspora, Armenian diaspora, uh, looking uh, to Turkey uh, from U.S. Because uh, yeah, Europe is more uh, uh, more close to us because of that. Maybe we understand Europe. We hear news from mm -hmm. uh, Europe, but U.S. is a uh, political. Uh, they have political togetherness with Turkey, but we don't hear much uh, about that. And also, I'm thinking: Is it right to? Uh, make a separation between Armenians like diasporians, Turkey, Armenia, or it's not right to do that because you, you know all these three countries and Armenians in there. Mm -hmm. First of all, there's no single diaspora. Diaspora doesn't have a state. That's the idea of diaspora. It's spread out. It means scattered, yeah. right? And even in America, there are different parts of the diaspora. So there are people who are very closely affiliated with the church. Mm -hmm. who may not be that political. Mm -hmm. There are people who are affiliated with the Dashnag Suçun, with the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, who are much more nationalist. Yeah. There are people, my own family, these were not many like this, but there were some, were left-wings. We were, we were yeah. called Haraj Dimakan, which means progressives. We were kind of pro-Soviet. Well, there's no Soviet Union anymore, so that's over, but there were many different kinds of groups. And today, as well, uh, there, you cannot generalize about a single diaspora. Mm -hmm. Very often in Turkey, I find, when they want to deal with the Armenian question, they demonize the diaspora. They say, ah, oh, the diaspora wants this and so forth. Now, many elements mm -hmm. who are most vocal in the diaspora mm -hmm. are even sometimes more nationalist than other Armenians. Mm -hmm. They're more interested in certain kinds of questions, more anti-Turkish, etc. Mm -hmm. Most Armenians in the West probably have very bad feelings about Turkey mm -hmm. because they don't know Turkey at all, mm -hmm. right? And as I said before, they were even suspicious of Hran Dink until mm -hmm. he was martyred uh, in 2007. But this is changing. Armenians by the dozens, hundreds, are coming to Turkey, visiting Armenia, seeing Akhtamar, seeing the church in Diyarbakir, visiting their home villages. So things are really changing in a radical way, even in, in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. Many prominent Armenian scholars who before would not come, 
are now coming. Uh, so this is, this, this is a very important, important development, it seems to me. So uh, let's pass to your book, Dad. Uh, up, what, is, uh, what is it about, your upcoming book, and when are we going to be able to read? Okay. At least in English, I think. Yeah. <laughs> there are two books we should talk about. The first book was the result of the Watts conferences. Mm -hmm. And that book is called A Question of Genocide. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was published by Oxford University Press and is a bunch of papers mm -hmm. edited by me, Muge Gerchek, and Norman Neymark. Mm -hmm. That book is being, has been translated by uh, Tari Vakf mm -hmm. and will come out in Turkish early next year. So people can read some of the results of our meetings there. Also, we can, they can share the experience, they can understand Absolutely. the experience that you had in yes, the books. Right. Now, after I had written that book, I thought, okay, I've written about the genocide, that's enough. But then Princeton University Press mm -hmm. has a series in human rights, and mm -hmm. the editor of that series, Eric Weitz, mm -hmm. asked me if I wouldn't write a small book on the genocide. So I began to work uh, based on the materials I have and the languages I know and so forth. And I've now finished the first draft of that manuscript. It will also appear next year. And it doesn't have a title yet. I have to think of the title. I'm still thinking about what, what, uh, what the title might be. There's a wonderful phrase that Talat said, they can live in the desert, but nowhere else. That might be the title, I don't know. It's about the Armenian genocide, about the events, and about the history of the Turks, the Armenians, the Kurds, and the empire that ultimately would choose to destroy one of their subject peoples, the Armenians, as well as their close cousins, the Assyrians. We must remember there was also an Assyrian genocide mm -hmm. along with the Armenian genocide. Mm -hmm. This, uh, when we are talking about uh, Syrian genocide and the deserts, uh, I'm always remembering Ray Raymond Kevorkian's uh, book, which came uh, in Turkish last year. It was about, uh, it was about placing the place, uh, placing on the map uh, mm -hmm. where uh, genocide what happens and it's exactly coming to your words which you uh, mentioned to uh, Talat Pasha's word. They can live in the desert yeah. and uh, nowhere, nowhere else. else. Uh, so when we are looking for this, uh, sometimes they call it de deportation, uh, but when we are looking for this happenings in 1915, uh, can I have, have some words that how are we going to deal in Turkey about this process, what's going on? We talked about historians, young historians, they're uh, working on it, but how can we uh, go one step forward uh, mm. after this? Because yes, Turkish people, uh, some academicians are learning Armenian, Armenians are learning Turkish. There are much more uh, exchanges between the countries even and between right. Armenians and Turks, but what's the stem, step beyond, uh, let's say? It's already happening. It's already happening. You think about uh, your foreign minister, David Olu's visit to Yerevan. Yeah. Uh, you think about uh, Prime Minister Erdogan's statement about condolences. Mm -hmm. uh, some people say it's not enough. They don't say genocide. Well, even mm -hmm. Obama doesn't use the word genocide. He calls it metzieren or aret or something using Armenian terms about catastrophe, mm -hmm. disaster, and so forth. Uh, I'm not the kind of person that makes a fetish mm -hmm. of the word genocide. I think it was a genocide. I think any conventional definition, it was the targeted killing of a specific people, two peoples in this mm -hmm. case, by a government, uh, mass murder. So it's a genocide, but I'm not worried about that. Uh, it seems to me some important steps have already been taken. Mm -hmm. When uh, Prime Minister Erdogan said that we, we, we want to express our condolences for the tragics, tragedies that happened to the Armenians. That was a step forward because before this, they accused Turkish official historians and the Turkish state accused the Armenians of being traitors, Hayin, mm. yeah. Davajan. You don't give condolences to traitors. You persecute traitors. If you are now giving condolences, that means, no, no, these were our subjects mm -hmm. who were mistreated, badly treated, the, a crime was done to these people, and we express our condolences. Mm -hmm. That's a step forward. Is it enough? No. Turkey still has to face its history, as Prime Minister, as Chancellor Mer Merkel said to Prime Minister Erdogan when he visited Germany, you must look the history in its face and recognize what happened, how the empire ended, 
how the republic was founded. And then you'll free yourself. And then again, we can live more or less peacefully together in this multicultural society. I, as a last question, I want to also talk about a bit, uh, what do you think about this uh, other governments? Uh, what do you think that, uh, what, what is the role of other governments in the world uh, on this issue to, like, let's say, peace process between Turks and Armenians and Turkey and Armenia? Uh, what are their roles? What can be their roles? Or is, do they have any roles in this? Because every 24 April when we are hearing that, okay, okay Obama is Obama going to say genocide? Mm -hmm. Or uh, even this, when uh, Sweden or Switzerland was having this deal, uh, I'm remembering a, a sentence which I heard from a 111 year old uh, Miss Agavni from Marseille. Uh, she was telling me, okay, is it going to, they're voting, they're using the word or not. Is mm -hmm. it going to prove that if my, uh, me and my mother were, was raped or uh, get out from Bursa and came to Marseille? Mm -hmm. uh, what is going to change if they say yes or no? The, what happens for them? Because we have so few people or maybe s uh, fingers of one hand uh, that uh, with numbers that they're living now from what they uh, lived in 1950 mm -hmm. uh, or the second generation. So what can be uh, the role uh, of other governments or other historians also, we can say, on this peace process? There are sort of two views on this. One is uh, other governments should do nothing mm -hmm. because it puts the Turkish government in a bad position and they have to look like they're making concessions or giving in to foreign pressure, and that's mm -hmm. always difficult for a government. My own view is uh, uh, that, uh, and you remember that Harant himself was not for these genocide resolutions mm -hmm. by foreign governments. Yeah. He didn't like those kinds of things. He wanted the Turkish government and Turkish society itself to come to recognize what happened, right? That's good. Now, my own view is that if foreign governments don't uh, at least acknowledge that mm -hmm. this, this genocide occurred and encourage, however subtly, however uh, uh, secretly even, the Turkish government to move on mm -hmm. this issue, then by not making pressure, by not saying anything about genocide, they are supporting the worst elements in Turkish society. They're supporting the nationalists, the denialists. If in fact you say, no, there was a genocide, and please, Turkey, now it's time to come and face your history, as Chancellor Merkel said. Then you are supporting those people I've called the progressive Turkish intelligentsia. You're supporting those people who want to be closer to Europe, mm -hmm. who want more democracy in this country, who want to open borders between foreign countries, uh, who want to make Turkey the kind of prosperous, progressive state that it's destined to be, it seems to me, in the future. Mm -hmm. So, thank you for coming. It was pleasure. a pleasure to uh, interview with you and uh, I hope and I think it was very informative for our viewers uh, that we're having these conversations, we're having these interviews uh, at Kamurj. Uh, thank you for coming. I hope we will see, we will have you again when you have the book with uh, from I'll bring Tar it to you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tarif Akfu and maybe we will give some uh, books from here over the program. Let's see. Uh, thank you for coming. Evet, bu akşam da e, burada noktalıyoruz Gamurçu. E, Gamurçu'da önümüzdeki haftalarda yine bu konularda e, tarihe bakış açısında akademik çalışmalar olsun, Ermeni soykırımının ele alınış tarzı olsun, Süryani soykırımı olsun tüm bu konuları gündeme taşımaya devam edeceğiz. E, önümüzde 2015 var, 2015 yaklaştıkça daha da çok aslında konuşulmaya başlanacak Türkiye'de. E, bu akşam da tamamlamış olalım Gamurçu. Sıdesutyon diyelim her hafta olduğu gibi. Haftaya görüşmek dileğiyle.